and welcome to the research learning series by SAAM. My name is Nick Hartman. I am an associate professor and associate residency program director from Wake Forest University, and I'm excited to serve as your moderator for this session on resident uh, uh, research curricula for EM residencies. I know this is an area that can be challenging for EM residency educators, and I'm glad to say that we will hear from a variety of perspectives and experts in this area today. Let's go ahead and introduce our panelists. Dr. Danielle McCarthy is an associate professor and vice chair of research in the Northwestern University Department of Emergency Medicine. She's an emergency physician and health services researcher whose work focuses primarily on doctor-patient communication in the emergency setting and health literacy. Her recent, recent research has focused on risk communication about opioids and improving communication about diagnostic uncertainty. Since completing her research training in 2012, she has been funded continuously on multiple grants from a range of foundations and federal agencies. She additionally co-leads the ARMED course for SAM. Dr. Andrew Kenneter is Assistant Professor of Emergency Medicine at Harvard Medical School and Associate Residency Program Director at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he oversees didactic education, simulation, and journal club. He completed his residency and was Chief Resident at Northwestern University's McGaw Medical Center, followed by a one-year fellowship in medical education research at BIDMC. Dimitri Nicola, uh, Dr. Dimitri Nicola is core faculty and research director at the Allegheny Health Network St. Vincent Emergency Medicine Residency Program, where he completed residency in 2019 and a research fellowship in 2022. He attended medical school at the Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine and completed a uh, master's in clinical research from Drexel University. Welcome to all of you. Let's start with a brief introduction uh, and background on research curricula in EM residency. As we also do, we can start with a question of why. Obviously, we have a lot to teach our EM residents, so why should we spend our time on this topic, and what are our actual goals and educational objectives? To start the answer, to answer this, we can point to both practical requirements and some aspirational ideals. To start with the practical, we know that every residency program has to fulfill the ACGME requirements. And one of the first content areas spelled out in the, in the requirements is related to research. An EM residency curriculum must contain advancement in the resident's knowledge of the basic principles of scientific inquiry, including how research is designed, conducted, evaluated, and explained to patients and applied to patient care. In fact, this is one of the first content areas specifically spelled out in ACGME program requirements. Requirements further state that residents must demonstrate competence in locating, appraising, and assimilating evidence from scientific studies related to their patients' health problems. So we know that the powers that be think this is an important topic for residents to learn about. I think from a big picture point of view as EM educators, we really have two important goals for our learners. First, we wanna introduce them as lifelong learners toward a goal of better understanding research studies that they will continue to encounter throughout their career in order to apply that information to their practice. And second, we wanna introduce them to some of the principles of actually conducting research, particularly for those who will make a career out of it, but also for those that, that won't, so they can better understand the process of advancing our field. I wanna introduce one attempt from the last few years to flesh out as a practical matter, what we should actually be teaching our residents about research. A group from the Cord Academy of Scholarship undertook a project to develop consensus around the elements of an EM research curriculum. The manuscript you see here is the result, which was a modified, uh, which was a modified uh, Delphi uh, consensus process involving experts in both EM research and education. I won't belabor the results of that process except to show you some of the topic categories that were felt to be important. The QR code on this slide will take you to the article, which includes a full list, as well as a repository of resources that can at least begin to address each of these topic areas. But the real question, of course, is how? How best to inspire interest in these topics and impart expertise? So to address this further, let's hear a little bit more from our panelists. So, let me stop share. All right, so each of you have a little bit uh, of something different to offer in terms of what your programs do for, uh, for curriculum. Please tell us about the objectives, the design and impl implementation of your research curriculum. And let's start with Dr. McCarthy. 
Great. Um, just want to say I'm uh, thrilled to be here and taking part in this and um, excited to see so many interested people um, and also excited to learn what um, Andrew and Dimitri are doing at their programs and hopefully from some of you guys, because I think part of um, part of what the uh, kind of constant in our program has been is that it's continually changing um, and that we're we have not yet perfected this and our, um, you know, uh, trying tweaks here and there. And um, I hope to learn from you guys today as well. So um, I have been at Northwestern now for um, 16 years, first as a resident and now as um, faculty. And as I said, things have evolved over time. Um, our main objective is to make sure that our uh, residents that are graduating are, are informed consumers of the research and then to also provide um, opportunities for those who are interested in learning about uh, research um, in more depth and exploring it as a career. But the four main components that we rely on for making sure that everyone's an informed consumer are, um, we have a, a research college, um, we have research week uh, that I'll talk about in more detail, we have a PGY1 seminar that's focused on interpreting research, and then we have a structured journal club that we call evidence-based medicine. Um, so the research college is part of our three arm college system. We have um, a pretty reduced college system compared to some places. We really still focus um, only on um, research education and administration, whereas I know other programs that have colleges have, um, you know, a, an ultrasound college or a wilderness medicine college. Uh, we are uh, still kind of just on those three main components. Um, the college sessions meet about 10 times a year during conference, and there's a large group and a small group format. Um, and in the large group format, the research college uh, would present on a research concept or have people um, present on their current research. And then in the small groups, um, they focus more on uh, specific projects that the residents or faculty are working on. Um, the research week is intended to be um, a, a brief but focused time for residents to narrow down and refine a research question um, or move a project forward. And there are other things that are available during that week, um, like some time with the research assistants to understand what goes into consent or time with the, the research librarian, kind of depending on, again, the stage that they're at. Um, our PGY1 seminar focuses on an intro to interpreting research and does um, a couple of kind of cool operational things in terms of uh, taking all the residents, all the incoming interns through city training um, and IRB registration so that they are kind of ready to roll and get started on projects. Um, and then also goes into topics like how to frame a research question and um, understanding things like sensitivity and specificity. And then lastly, our evidence-based medicine journal club um, is integrated into conference time, um, meets once a month, and reviews two or three articles with a focus on um, a, a specific kind of unifying research topic and clinical topic. And the residents um, prepare these conferences with one of the research faculty, and uh, three residents present each month, and it's moderated by the research faculty. All right, and to Dr. Kidder. Yeah, um, I'll go ahead and echo Danielle's uh, uh, sentiments. Thank you guys for, for having me, and it's wonderful to see uh, so many people here. It's uh, great to see all, all, the, all the names I recognize from, from various walks of life here. Um, so brief, briefly, um, our, our research curriculum has undergone a little bit of an overhaul recently. We have kind of broadly speaking, a sort of two-armed approach to teaching research concepts. Um, first of all, there's research conference, which is one of our sort of longitudinal tracks that we incorporate through our Wednesday morning didactics throughout the year. Um, and that meets for about an hour to an hour and a half at a time, six to eight times per year. Complementing that is our journal club, which uh, meets in the evenings on Tuesdays, also six to eight times per year, but more if we can. Um, and the goal with this kind of recent overhaul that we've undergone is to essentially make these complementary to another. Um, research conference um, in the past, and I guess we'll get to this a little bit later, but it focuses on um, ongoing studies that our faculty are, are doing right now, um, but the way that we're changing things to make it a little bit more, um, give, give a little bit more takeaways for our, for our residents is to have it focus on study type and design. So 
um, you know, introductions about, say, case control designs or randomized control trials or that sort of thing, with then using active faculty or resident projects as an example for how that might be rolled out in a sort of like real world scenario, as opposed to like reading a biostatistics textbook about what this type of trial design should actually should actually look like. Um, Complementing that is Journal Club, which critically applies critical review to um, three articles, usually kind of like what uh, Danielle was saying they do at Northwestern on, on like a specific kind of research topic, but sometimes it's focusing on a certain trial type, for example, to compare and contrast different uh, questions against one another and compare and contrast um, actual implementation. Um, the way that works is essentially we meet at a, at a sushi restaurant in the evenings and um, three residents are assigned one per journal article and that resident um, basically gives an overview of the journal article and initial critiques. And then there are two faculty who are responsible for helping kind of facilitate discussion, both with the residents and faculty that are in attendance, and also with the, the residents who are primarily assigned to um, overview the articles, looking at the strengths and weaknesses of each and ultimately, okay, what are the, what are the takeaways from, from each of these articles that we're going over? Um, again, I say that these two arms are supposed to be complementary to one another because the research conference is really supposed to be, okay, understanding what are trial types and trial designs and how does that what are the hiccups that happen when that gets rolled out in real time? And then critically applying our ability to read published literature to our, you know, not to our knowledge of those trial types and uh, and the uh, kind of logistical hurdles that might present themselves. Um, and it, the the sushi uh, aspect of it, you know, free beer and sushi helps out any kind of uh, academic discussion. Awesome. And Dr. Nicola. Sure. So um, again, thank you for having me. Appreciate being here. It's um, really a delight for me to be here um, because I'm a new research director. <laughs> so, um, so this has been um, uh, both a challenge for me and really exciting um, as I kind of take the reins. Um, so we're a small program in Erie, Pennsylvania. Um, we've been around for 20 years, but uh, we only have six residents per class. So it's a little bit of a different environment. Um, there's only two residency programs at our hospital, so we're, we're pretty much unopposed procedurally. And so uh, we just get uh, a, unique, a unique group of residents who um, generally, they, like, they, come here, they come here because um, it's that kind of environment where, you know, uh, there's no ICU fellow, it's just the ER residents. Um, and so um, research education looks a little different, you know, at, at a program like ours. Um, it used to be uh, just a, journal, a monthly journal club with a brief lecture um, to start it out. Um, and then um, I kind of took the reins about six months ago um, where I basically added in um, a curriculum to, the, to, to those lectures, um, as opposed to those lectures really just trying to educate the residents on like the methods or the statistics that they might read in the particular papers that month. Um, I built in a curriculum um, for those lectures so that um, it's um, that they, they cover a base, a knowledge base um, that they're going to need. Um, in addition, we changed the way Journal Club um, gets presented. So instead of having one resident present uh, each article, um, what we do now is we have three residents present each article. But instead of summarizing the article, one takes um, the pro position, another takes the con position, and then another teaches the rest of the group some other methodological or statistical technique. Um, and it, we, despite you know, being a community program, I've had some really great feedback from the residents, primarily because it really um, stimulates discussion around the methods of the paper rather than just the results or whether the results apply to their clinical care, which that's important too, but um, this really teaches residents um, more about the, um, the research methods, which is really what this research curriculum is all about, right? Um, it um, typically um, reiterates a lot of the topics that um, are part of the uh, critical appraisal curriculum that, that we teach. Um, and it helps residents or reminds residents to go to those checklists, those critical appraisal checklists when they're reading a paper to make sure they're not missing something when they're interpreting a study. Uh, it also puts them out of their comfort zone, right? Because instead of just summarizing what's going on in the paper, they actually have a job to do. They have to figure out what the pros, what the cons are, and they have to teach the, their co-residents something that they may not really know about. So they have to go and educate themselves and then educate the group. Um, and then it also gives me another opportunity to interact and teach with the residents because oftentimes yeah. they're trying to create their presentations and, and they come to me and they say, oh, I don't really understand what 
you know, bootstrapping is, or can you, can you help me? And, and so it gives me another opportunity to teach the residents. There are some limitations and weaknesses we've, we've kind of encountered. It's um, you oftentimes have to pick the right article, right? If, if you pick like, I mean, there's no, there's no like perfect study, but um, if you pick a, a, a really, really well done RCT, you know, a big journal, um, there, there may not be enough pros or enough cons, you know, to kind of stimulate discussion. So sometimes you do have to, or I have to kind of um, pick the article that might kind of help residents um, find pros and cons and, and help um, stimulate the discussion from a teaching standpoint. Um, and then I, not that it's not important, but I think I, I touched upon it a little earlier, but uh, what Journal Club used to just turn into like an argument about whether it's clinically relevant you know, or, or whatnot. And now I, I found that this kind of structure helps kind of move the discussion away from that and more to, you know, what, what are the methods? How do we interpret the study? Do, do the, are the methods reasonable? Are they not reasonable? And, and how do they apply um, to our care as opposed to just do they apply to our care or not? Um, but the other weaknesses though are that residents do have to read the articles. <laughs> so uh, we try not to summarize them. And uh, we all know that not all residents Come to journal club prepared um, and um, right now we only have two uh, formally trained research faculty members um, and so um, it does help to have one of us there because um, not all faculty um, research isn't always their thing uh, and so um, some of the nuances may not be clear um, to those who haven't you know um, had, had formal training in research Great, thank you all. Uh, it's really helpful to hear from a variety of perspectives and, and uh, ways of going about this. And I just wanted to say to all of our participants, please feel free to, to put any questions that you have for the panel or for individual panelists um, in the chat. And I will, I will moderate that as we go through. Um, so uh, hearing about all the great things that you're doing, I wondered, are there any you know, previous or maybe even, even current um, research curriculum components that you know, maybe didn't work out or aren't working out uh, as well as you'd hope, hoped? Any, uh, any pitfalls? Maybe start with, uh, start with Andrew this time. Um, yeah, so I mentioned that um, we recently overhauled um, you know, both the research conference and the journal clubs we run. And that was partially in response to some things that weren't really working out as well. Um, I think in a lot of its previous iteration, our research conference um, has been, you know, mostly as a forum for people to present their ongoing research, whether that's faculty or residents or whoever. And certainly that's an important, you know, an, an important item potentially for professional development, especially for residents who are going to be presenting at SAM or CORD or ASAP or any of these national conferences, um, having a forum where they can sort of practice their presentations and get at least initial feedback on their research studies, um, I think is helpful in many ways. Um, the problem is that you know, while it may be good for the person at the front of the room, it's not as clearly useful for the rest of the audience, right? Like didactic time is limited and certainly a, a resident in the audience who's listening to, you know, their colleague's presentation about their specific research project might justifiably wonder, okay, great, but like I've got, I've got three years to learn emergency medicine, man, right? Like, why are we spending my time doing this? Um, and um, that in concert with the fact that a lot of the feedback often um, that comes from, you know, the actual rollout of a trial is, Okay, this should be a randomized controlled trial. And well, well, great. Well, I don't have the I don't have the funding for that for this project is, is really the answer to the most part for that. So while some of the feedback can be um, useful in those in those respects, it's not, I think, as uh, helpful from a didactic perspective as pairing that with um, you know a discussion of study types and why I chose, say, a case control design as opposed to a randomized control trial with the study type, and what are the hiccups of each and why you might choose one um, versus the other. Um, and kind of concurrent with that for journal club, um, you know, the way that that has been um, conducted in the past has been essentially, so there's two faculty assigned each journal club, right? And they pick three articles for the residents to, to, to discuss, which has the advantage of course, you know, keeping the residents on top of like contemporary developments in emergency medicine research and kind of what are people doing right now that might change our current practice. Um, the problem is that sometimes, you know, faculty who may have forgotten, uh, for example, that they were due to uh, facilitate journal club or um, just hadn't had the time to uh, select, like go through the literature out there on a specific topic of interest um, might have a hard time selecting articles that are either 
well done or demonstrate like poorly done in a sort of instructive way, right? Um, and so the articles that do getting picked are maybe not like the best quality that we might want for either the topic under discussion or the um, you know the the you know take homes that we're trying to get. Um, one thing we're trying to do to mitigate that uh, is to make at least one of the articles discussed like a foundational piece of uh, emergency medical literature. So like there's certain articles that all of us need to be familiar with, right? Like rivers, process, like all these things that sort of set the stage for why we do what we do. And everybody should have a good understanding of the evidence behind each of those things and how that informs our current clinical practice. And then using that not only to enhance kind of familiarity with um, uh, kind of what we might think of as the Kind of the, the dogma of our specialty, but then kind of okay as a springboard for okay what are the what are the developments next in um, in this particular area of interest right so that we can contrast contemporary developments against what we think of as being the sort of tried and true aspects of uh, of what exists out there with EBM. Um, I see I do see a question in the chat about uh, how we choose faculty to facilitate journal club. Um, it is open uh, initially to uh, core faculty uh, for the most part, but we do want to open it up to um, non-core faculty as well, because certainly we have a lot of people doing interesting research who aren't necessarily in like the, the core faculty aspect of, of running the residency program, um, who we want to give a forum to to discuss, uh, even if it's not their specific research um, areas in their in their field. Um, so we have a whole, we have a whole running list. And to Danielle. Um, yeah, so the the evidence based medicine journal club and the um, intern seminar and the research week have been pretty static over time. Um, at, you know, maybe 10 years ago, we changed from a, a you know, um, journal club in somebody's home with the articles selected by the people that were leading the module to this more in conference time um, article selected by uh, one of the researchers and the presentations um, pre-reviewed by one of the research faculty to make sure that the statistical concepts are being presented correctly. Um, but the, the main um, place where we've had a lot of movement is within our uh, research college and how we do that. Um, probably, I don't know, seven or eight years ago, we had uh, much higher levels of participation and we were um, plugging along for a while where the research college was kind of like a work in progress for the residents who were really actively involved in projects. And so um, the research college was producing like a manuscript a year um, where we were sort of collectively meeting as a group and using data from our electronic data warehouse to answer a question that the residents came up with at the beginning of the year. Um, and it was it was humming for you know two three years in a row, um, and there was a high level of interest. And then um, it was really spearheaded by residents who were passionate about the questions and passionate about research and willing to put in extra time outside of those research college sessions. Uh, and so when those residents weren't were no longer there, um, that dropped off. And over time, our participation in the college also dropped off. And so, you know, to be honest, we would have times where we would have like four or five research faculty show up and like three residents show up. And um, it was awesome for them in terms of their faculty to resident ratio, um, but it wasn't like the, the best use of time. And so we tried a couple of other things to evolve it. We, you know, tried to have, um, a research consultation during that time where residents could come and pitch an idea kind of shark tank style and we would help to you know sort out how would you make that project actually um, feasible and um, how would you get it done on a uh, or get a similar project done on a red resident budget and timeline um, and that worked for a year or two, um, but again, participation uh, is, is overall low in the research college compared to our education and admin colleges. And that's when we started to go to this more hybrid format of um, the college doing some of its presentations of content in the large group format so that uh, the residency as a whole can learn more um, from, the, from the college uh, format. Right. And Dimitri, any any pitfalls that you've experienced? Sure, I, I think you know much like Danielle alluded to. Um, there's this balance between those who want to 
attend research sessions or journal clubs to kind of hear about the latest research, um, which I think is like the classic idea of what journal club is. And then there are probably those of us who are more research enthusiasts who would like to teach, you know, um, the, the methods and like to better understand new methods and, and understand how the study was done and, and what are the, the, the pros and the cons of, of, of those articles and um, trying to find what's right for the program um, at your at, at, that you're at and what the mission of your group is, is probably how you answer that question. Um, you know, and that was that was what we kind of struggled with was that a, a lot of our faculty members, not our core faculty members, but a lot of our faculty members kind of like to come to journal club because they wanted to hear, you know, what's new and what's, you know, what do we have because oftentimes like the topic would be picked off, picked up, um, picked off of what like uh, what issue we had in the department at any given time, like if, if we when we just got high sensitivity troponins, you would cover a journal club on high sensitivity troponins. And, and so we as a group can kind of better understand the literature. Um, well, is, is that the mission of your pro program to do that? Or is it the mission of your program to use journal club or these research sessions to, to teach the research? Well, I think that's that's different for every program. You have to find what's what's right for you and, and, and what's right for your group. Um, and I, it sounds like, uh, Danielle, Andrew, your programs are kind of doing the right thing. You, you guys have like a combination of things, uh, of, of offerings, um, so everybody can kind of get what they what they need. Um, but if, again, it depends on the program. If I tried to split it up, um, I, I would probably get zero attendance to, to, to like research college meetings. <laughs> so, so I try and uh, subtly uh, slip it into journal club so that I can provide the residents um, uh, very subtly a uh, research education um, that, that they maybe are less enthusiastic about. Yeah, thanks very much. Yeah, I think that goes really goes to a question I see in the chat here about what is, and I really appreciate the use of science as a verb here. How, how could we science the best research curriculum? How could we figure that out? And it would hinge on those outcome measures. And that may differ from program to program in terms of what um, what your real uh, emphases are, what what uh, your your goals as a program uh, are. I wanted to just open up any any other thoughts on that, um, this tension between those, those things among, uh, among any of our panelists. Yeah, I think it's a great question. I think the, the real question is like what outcome measures are relevant here, right? Like sometimes it's um, correct application of kind of clinical take homes from the articles that we're talking about, but really like, is that is that the point of research conference? I mean, I would argue that I think that Dimitri brought this up earlier that really what we want the take home to be is uh, from a lot of these kind of didactic items is, you know, can you, you know, appropriately critically apply reasoning skills to evaluating EBM such that when it comes across your desk in the future, can you apply that clinically? It's not like the clinical application, like the core clinical message of what we're talking about. It's the ability to actually appropriately critique the, the, the literature that's out there or perform your research yourself if you end up, if that's the route that uh, you end up going. Yeah, there, there definitely, there definitely is like some sort of core critical appraisal knowledge um, that probably all residents, not just emergency medicine residents, definitely need to have um, in their future practice. I'm just not sure um, where where that line is drawn, you know, um, for every physician in every specialty and every practice environment. Um, but but there probably is some core, you know, um, knowledge that 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 all physicians probably should have some 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 idea about. Um, I, but yeah, I, I think it's a great idea to to try and define that. I see Josh's comment in the in the chat about hasn't COVID nineteen highlighted this point. I one hundred percent agree. Um, and something else that we didn't mention uh, or I didn't mention before is one of the things that we've integrated into our evidence based medicine is also um, occasionally having one of the uh, like primary sources that people look at not be um, an article but we will put a FOMED piece in that is paired with the article. And then we'll have a discussion about like, what were your takeaways from the FOMED or from the tweet or from, you know, whatever, versus what are your takeaways when we dive into the evidence-based medicine and dissect the study. Um, and I think that that has been um, helpful uh, to learners who are often getting their, um, 
their information from multiple different uh, formats. And Brett's asking about templated structure for the journal club presentations. There, it's not a it's not a strict uh, template, but it it varies month to month. Um, but there there is uh, some structure behind it. I think one of the benefits of being here at a a, a, a you know big research uh, university, big research group, is we have uh, I think um, eight uh, physician investigators and five PhD investigators, and so. Um, Scott Dresden's actually the one who runs the evidence-based medicine, um, and I can see if I can get his template and share it. Um, and I also have support from other people with um, Alex Lowe being our director of uh, resident research and helping to run the, the research week. Yeah, we have a uh, site. Oh, I was, yeah, I was going to say, I, I provide them critical appraisal templates, but I don't necessarily provide them like presentation templates. Yeah. Yeah, there's a sort of guide that we've developed, I think, along the same lines and everything, but it's it's meant to serve as a guide, right? Like it doesn't need to be rigidly applied to every single article that you necessarily read, but you should be able to like talk about the construction of an article in logical ways. I really like the idea, Danielle, of uh, having like FOMED takeaways paired with the actual research, just because I feel like being able to critically appraise, you know, what's out there on like MCRIT or, you know, Rebel EM or whatever is is just as valuable a set of tools um, as being able to like look at you know articles in AJM or whatever. Great, and you know we've we've brought up a number of times perspectives from from residents and what 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 do residents want? What do they respond to? So I wanted to dive into a little bit more of the the voice of the resident and see if there are particular things that uh, you you get commonly as themes, uh, you know, positive or negative in terms of feedback from uh, from residents that participate in these programs. And maybe first to uh, to Dimitri. Sure. Um, you know, I, I, oddly enough, um, I, I I wasn't expecting it, but I've I've had really positive feedback with the way I've structured Journal Club, having the residents try and actively um, present the pros of every article, the cons of every article, and teach each other uh, methods and and statistics, um, which I wasn't expecting. Um, but it it's it's I guess it's a way of, of turning the journal club from like a passive type of learning to an active type of learning um, that is not only going from passive to active, but um, actually takes less time. So instead of like going through these articles and, and trying to create these long presentations and making sure you're not missing anything, um, they really are given a single task. Like what, um, what is uh, considered to be a pro? What's considered to be a con? And, and so um, like, Last night we had journal club and one of my residents gave a five to 10 minute discussion on interim analyses, right? And so it was just the basics that um, most residents really didn't understand what that was or what the purpose was or, or how it's done. Um, but now the group understands it and they understand why it's done. And, um, and so I've, I've actually had really positive feedback. I, I have um, had some negative feedback from some, from one attending. <laughs> um, and I, I kind of brought this up, but, um, Sometimes residents um, do get like empowered uh, to apply research to clinical practice. And sometimes they can kind of haphazardly become early adopters. And um, so I, I, I just bring that up because um, our job is to be a motivators. You know, our job is to motivate residents and try and, and be the research enthusiasts and try and try and get them interested in it too. But um, we do also have to like be real about what uh, a resident research curriculum can accomplish and, and what it's meant to do and um, uh, how does that, how, how do our residents kind of perceive it and how do they apply it? And because even though you know, we, we, we generally tear apart articles during journal club, um, for some reason, it, it just, uh, for a lot, of, a lot of residents, it just stimulates this enthusiasm where they hear about something on like FOMED and then they're like, oh my God, I'm gonna do this now. <laughs> so I just kind of bring that up as a, maybe a potential consequence. Yeah, and, you I know, can... that's, that's it. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Daniel. I was just going to say that is something that we, uh, I think you're not alone in, in seeing that occasionally. I wondered if anybody had thoughts on curricular based ways that we can help uh, kind of uh, focus that, that energy appropriately. Yeah, I've, I've sort of found it helpful from like an introductory kind of point of view um, to talk to the residents about um, 
you know, being early adopters and like going against the grain of like the standard of practice, right? I think the soapbox that I usually end up getting on as, as an example is like the, you know, the, 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 the OMI manifesto, right? Like it's this famous article that's on, I think, Palm Crit, um, written by Scott Weingart and Steve Smith, I think, um, which, you know, it's it's talking about like patient comes in with ischemic presentation and ischemic changes on their EKG, treat them like they have ischemia, right? Like it makes sense, but like, the way that it's written, I think the way that I've seen a lot of uh, residents kind of take home the message from it is that um, we should ignore STEMI criteria because their evidence basis isn't as, as robust as it might be. And like the whole world operates on STEMI criteria, right? So like um, saying that you read this item and it makes sense to you, so you're just going to completely change and veer away from the current standard of practice doesn't make a lot of sense in a lot of ways that have more to do with kind of logistical functioning in the hospital uh, reasons than they do with like, okay, what is what is the underlying science behind this? And maybe things will change. And it's important to keep in mind that again, like someone comes in with crushing subternal chest pain and diaphoresis with the ischemic chambers of their EKG is probably having acute myocardial ischemia. But like also recognize that that doesn't automatically mean that we need to change everything we do just based on an, what effectively is an opinion article. Um, I, 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 the only reason I pick on that is because the usual soapbox that I get on when I talk about, okay, here's this new thing that just came out. Let's think about it before we say, okay, I'm going to take this to the bedside. Daniel. Uh, I, I don't know that I have a great way to, to curb the resident enthusiasm. We, we, we also have similar stories of, uh, to yours where, uh, Wes self came and gave us a grand rounds on, uh, his study of, um, uh, normal saline versus balanced crystalloid. And um, we like ran out of LR for the next two or three weeks in a row. We actually did a retrospective study looking at like the volume of saline versus LR that we gave in pre and post Wes's talk that we're still trying to get published. But so if anybody wants to uh, give me some journal suggestions, but um, but I, I do think that uh, going back to the, the prior question of the feedback that we get, um, I think that um, we, we've gotten good feedback on having the structure to the evidence-based medicine. Um, I think that the um, feedback uh, on the research week is like, this is way, way too short to accomplish any research, but like the vast majority of our residents are not that interested in actually accomplishing, you know, massive amounts of high quality research during the residency. And so I think they also appreciate it just being a break from clinical work for a week um, that gives them a little bit of reprieve and, and space to think about their career. Um, and um, I'd say that the overall feedback that we get on, on research in general is that residents don't have a great sense about what's going on within the department and that they have probably some interest in being engaged, but they want to kind of have the menu of items on which they could become engaged. Um, and that's something we're, we're, you know, trying to solve too, but I think there's also always some um, hesitation about let, you know, just putting out a menu of all of your research opportunities uh, and, you know, possibly getting overwhelmed with the number of people who are interested um, and uh, them not being actually interested or committed in uh, to research uh, on the whole. So, um, yeah. Very good. And uh, to take a, a little a little bit of a side road here, um, you know, we, of course, we talked about the requirements that relate to the research curriculum and how in teaching about research and ways to do that. Of course, there's also a scholarly activity requirement that exists and is kind of another aspect and and may be strongly connected with the curric the curriculum for research or or may not be. So I wanted to um, get your um, get your all uh, takes on how that uh, connects and how that works in your residency. If, is there uh, is there a connection or in, an influence of your your curriculum on um, the way that your residents fulfill that scholarly requirement? And maybe Danielle first. Yeah, I can I can go first. Um, I'd say that all all of our different moving pieces of our curriculum are not necessarily designed to. Um, uh, generate scholarly projects. They are more to provide a background knowledge and to stimulate interest. Um, and then the residents uh, seek out their scholarly projects independently. Um, I mentioned earlier that we do have a, a large research faculty. And so Alex Lowe is the director of resident research and he 
meets with the residents kind of one on one to discuss their interests and to try and provide them direction on um, research projects. And I think that um, despite, you know, uh, complaining that there's not a great awareness of, of what's going on, um, that the the people who are really uh, interested and engaged in research do are able to find um, what the projects are and or we create projects for them. And so um, we've had uh, pretty high rates of residents going on to um, research fellowship uh, over the years. And so the, the opportunities are are there. Yeah, Dimitri. Um, you know, we are a smaller program. It probably works a little differently. You know, where, where we're at. Um, I'd say mo all, all residents participate in research uh, in, in some way or another um, at our program. And actually, for those who may not be aware, but um, we we were an osteopathic program before we became a, a, an ACGME approved program. And under the osteopathic model. Um, all residents had to um, complete a research paper that actually got submitted to the research committee of the ACOAP and got like graded. Um, so, um, so that has kind of stuck around a little bit in our program. So all residents do participate in research. Now, to what degree does that happen? Um, it, it, you know, you have some residents that are a PI, they apply for grants and they do their project and they're running the, the show. Um, and then you have some residents who are kind of along for the ride, um, but um, there. Yeah, so that that probably for most residents that really does fill their scholarly activity requirements. Uh, some residents will go on and, and do some do leadership roles in, in organized medicine and do some advocacy work that certainly would also qualify as scholarly activity. But um, I'd say for for most of our residents, it, it, the research work is what um, fills that criteria for scholarly activity. Yeah, I, I um, tend to take the same kind of approach. I mean, really, I think it comes down to, you know, what you want the outcomes of the research curriculum to be. Um, and I, I think that we all kind of share the approach that like, you know, from a didactic point of view, the whole point of having a research curriculum is to have the skills to, even if you're not going to be a researcher at all, be able to critically appraise literature going forward, because you're going to need to do that for the rest of your career. Um, and the kind of research requirement for residents, um, individual scholarly projects, certainly the, you know, the research conference that we do um, can be a forum for people to present their own work and get feedback on it and everything. But um, that shouldn't be, in my opinion, the primary goal of what you use your didactic time for, um, because the didactic time should benefit everybody. Certainly it's valuable, again, from a professional development perspective to give residents a forum where they can talk about their own projects and receive feedback and be intellectually honest about you know, what they're doing um, in terms of their academic projects. But it really should be you know, a learning experience for everybody, the audience included as well. Very good, thank you. And uh, just a word about uh, any future directions you see for your program, things that you're hoping to, to do uh, here in, in, the, in the near future. Thank Start with, uh, with, with Danielle. Yeah, we, um, as I said, we had, we've had a, a decent amount of success with, uh, you know, one of 15 residents um, in any given year going on to uh, National Clinical Scholars or to T32 programs. And, um, uh, you know, I think that we feel good about the level of support that we're able to provide to that, you know, one interested individual that wants to pursue this um, for their career. Um, I think that for the, the masses, we probably will continue to evolve uh, the research college format um, uh, because the, the small group um, setup does have such low participation. Um, we also have a, a link with the university to their um, uh, physician scientist training program, which gives us extra resources. And um, we recently applied for an R25 uh, research training grant which would create an NIH funded research track within the residency. Um, and so we are kind of looking to, to double down on the, the resources that are available to those, you know, one or two people who are really interested in a career um, in research. And uh, we, we were scored well, we're awaiting a, a funding decision. Um, but I think that the, the main takeaways for me are that, um, 
uh, the vast majority are not going to go into research and to not take that personally and to focus the vast majority of your curricular efforts on um, the masses and their understanding of research and that uh, for those that are going into the career in research, it's more about mentorship and one-on-one -on -one time and, and applied skills and projects than about this uh, kind of limited time that you have in the didactics. Yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're all kind of shooting to improve the program, right? Um, you know, coming from a community program, um, it's a lot more challenging to be anywhere in the running for any large grants. Um, but we have a lot of support from our local medical school. We can get pretty much like unlimited small grants um, from not unlimited, but we can get several small grants a year to help do what we want to do. And um, part of our motivation the last couple of years has, has been to get medical students more involved and try and partner with the medical students from our local medical school to work with us and, and um, I guess create a, a little bit more um, of a transition in, in research education from going on from medical school to residency and, and beyond. And hopefully that um, deepens the bench, you know, for, for our group. Um, I think from our point of view, something that I'd, I'd like to develop a little bit further is to increase kind of resident leadership within the research conference structure. Um, we are fortunate that uh, a couple of our uh, rising seniors are really interested in um, engaging with both the content and the format of Journal Club and helping me kind of rework some of the things that I'm trying to rework as well. Um, I'd like to be I'd like that to become a um, sustainable thing where we have resident leadership every year, because of course, um, you know, le uh, learner styles change and and everything and having somebody who's sort of on the ground to help develop that in a sustainable way, I think is um, I think is valuable and is certainly another opportunity for leadership outside the say the chief resident role and our chief residents are kind of busy enough with their own stuff that this isn't a fair task to just be like hey guys do this too. Um, I think another route that I'd, I'd like to see is that so we do have, um, you know, a regular supply, even if it's on a, a kind of lower level, kind of similar to what Danielle was saying, of people who do go into research as a career. Um, and something that we don't have a whole lot of is guidance on, say, the whole grant application structure and what background you need to have if that's something you are considering as a career. And I think the career guidance is something that I would certainly want to build on. Um, I think having that as part of uh, didactics or journal club is probably outside the scope of what I want either of those things to do. But we do have a, um, a couple of research cores here, one of whom uh, runs a sort of longitudinal curriculum on the grant application process and, and what all that involves. So I'd like to partner with them a little bit more closely to provide a route for um, interested residents, interested trainees to um, kind of augment their, uh, their their education from like the core residency to include that um, a little bit more sustainably as well. Following off of that comment, Andrew, I would uh, put in a plug for um, SAEM Armed um, okay. for uh, I'd say that the, the vast majority of people that we have enrolled in ARMED are um, uh, junior faculty or fellows, but every year we do have um, two or three uh, residents who are kind of interested and, and looking to increase their knowledge about what, what grants are, what different research methodologies are, and it could be kind of a a fun little overview um, before they decide to make a, a career jump into research or not. So we'd we would welcome more residents as well. I would definitely second that. Um, I did Embers as a first year attending, and it was what taught me that I needed to go get my master's in clinical research and do a research fellowship. I, I didn't realize that until I had done Embers and then tried to do research that I realized that there was just so much that I didn't know that um, that motivated me to go on and, and, and get a, a you know, formal training in research. Great. And last question I have for our panelists is, you know, if you are uh, to give advice to people who may be in a position similar to yours or or anywhere where they may be taking the reins of a, of a either a journal club or the research curriculum for a residency, any words of advice that you would have uh, for them? Yeah, again, I think a lot of it has to do with just what outcomes you want, right? Like what outcomes your residents currently getting and how do you want to change things such that they're getting outcomes other than that, right? Um, and um, 
again, from from our perspective, we really are trying to change things such that it is more of a grounded curriculum and you know re research type science or a, a trial type and everything and how to apply your understanding of those things to evaluating individual journal articles as a sustainable thing but that might not be what you want right it might not be kind of what your residents need or what your what your institution needs and so kind of figuring out okay what what base am i working from and how do i want to change that i think is the is the first step towards um kind of figuring out where you want to go from your from your research curriculum perspective yeah i think that's a big point you know um think about what the, the mission is for your program and, and what your program is trying to accomplish and what resources you have. And, um, you know, like I mentioned earlier, we only have two really research faculty who are, who are um, you know, formally trained. And um, so you, you get some residents that, you know, they run the show, they run their own project and they do a phenomenal job and you get some residents that are along for the ride. Um, and then you get like a decent number of residents who are like super interested and they might start something, but they maybe just don't have the bandwidth or the skills or the knowledge to kind of move a project forward. Um, and sometimes it's easy as research director to get caught up in those projects. And then you find yourself all of a sudden spending, you know, a couple of days a week <laughs> dedicating it to like your residence project that was never anything you were interested in or, or it wasn't even a part of like what you were doing originally. Um, and so, um, I would just you know think about what you know what, what's the mission what's the mission for your job your program and and um where can where can you add value um because uh, you still want to motivate those those individuals because some of those interested individuals who maybe just don't have the knowledge that they need that you can you can bring them up to speed but sometimes you can't and so you just um i guess uh, uh know your residents and 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 try try and um figure out how best you can serve them while um while being a, um, an asset to the whole program, not just those individuals. Yeah, I don't know that I have much more to add that I haven't already said. I think that that um, you know flexibility and uh, humility in recognizing that your your first or your second or your third iteration of the curriculum may not be um, you know delivering and that you need to to flex and change as uh, learning styles change and as uh, based on the feedback that you're getting um, and that uh, that research isn't for everyone it's not um, we you know we have 40 something people on there 30 something people on this call which is awesome um, and you guys are all probably research nerds like us um, but it is it is not for everyone and that I have just tried to not take it personally when participation is low and instead to focus on, you know, how can we um, graduate 15 residents a year who are in, informed consumers um, of research, even if they are not uh, going to follow my career path. Very good. Well, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate uh, everyone's time today. We do have a few minutes left here. So if there are other questions uh, that uh, anyone has, please feel free to, to put them in the chat. And we'll try to um, get those addressed here in the last couple of minutes. I do see one that I don't think we've addressed um, that I can start to take a swing at, but see if others have uh, things to add. Um, there's one, is there any standardized prepackaged research curricula out there to teach methodology, evidence-based medicine, similar to foundations of EM? Uh, I will say, I don't know of anything that is quite as, uh, you know, focused as well as complete uh, as foundations sort of ready to go like that. There are, um, as we've pointed to, a number of, uh, you know, frameworks. There's the, you know, in terms of what topics to cover uh, that are out there, the, the article that we highlighted before. Uh, there's uh, also individual courses, like uh, Danielle pointed out, the armed course. Um, there are um, video, you know, videos and little uh pieces here and there that can be highlighted. And I know there's been some discussion about creating modules uh, that would be very sim similar to what you're, uh, what I think is described there, but I don't know of anything that is uh, complete, but maybe, maybe one of our other panelists or someone else on the chat has a, has a recommendation. I usually point residents to how to read a paper by Trisha Greenhall. I, I think it's a great introduction to, to, to critical appraisal and probably does 90% of what you're looking for in a critical appraisal curriculum, it's a it's a pretty easy read. No, I think Nick touched on all the ones that I'm aware of. So I I think that um, 
it, it would be nice to have a foundation style, uh, you know, exportable uh, resource. I, I do think also that um, a lot of what the the research learning series is, is doing um, is sort of providing some of the the building blocks that we could use to um, to create that curriculum. Um, and I think there there are other uh, you know SAM resources. Um, I'm blanking on the name of the uh, research and emergency medicine book that is also on the SAM website um, that is uh, a valuable resource, but I don't think there's sort of prepackaged uh, resident level EBM didactics. As uh, someone who's involved with some of the leadership structure with Foundations of Emergency Medicine, if any of y'all want to put together a prepackaged curriculum, I think that would be a terrific addition to Foundations. All right, very good. If there are any other questions, uh, please bring them forward. But otherwise, again, thank you so much to each of our, our panelists. I really appreciate your time, all of your different perspectives and experiences and uh, your willingness to share them um, here with SAM community. Uh, that is uh, really uh, deeply appreciated. And I also wanna thank everybody who's taken the time to spend uh, spend this hour with us and uh, and talk about these things that we're all that we're all a little bit nerdy about, but that uh, we care about passionately and are important for our uh, for our EM learners. So, thank you all very much for uh, for your time today. <laughs>